Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Module 2, Organisation of Living Things. What we'll be doing in this video is to investigate the function of structures in a plant, including but not limited to tracing the development and movement of the products of photosynthesis. And when you start looking through some of these statements, um, they, can, they can be a little confusing. So what we want to try and do is see if we can focus on a couple of the key ideas, and that's what we want to uh, do, certainly with this little introductory video. The main thing that I'm focusing on here is this tracing the development um, and also the movement of the products of photosynthesis. So how are they developed, where have they developed, and where do they go? So that's pretty much what we're going to focus on in this particular video. So you're probably sick of seeing these equations by now, but they are very, very important, and so they're ones that we will um, have to keep referring to from time to time. Importantly, carbon dioxide and water are the reactants in photosynthesis. Glucose and oxygen are the products. So we're looking at uh, focusing on the products of photosynthesis in this case. So we are interested in what's happening, uh, how are the glucose and oxygen produced, and where are they going once they have been produced? A German named Engelmann carried out an experiment in the late 19th century and uh, found what I guess we now accept as the case is that um, red and violet are the two wavelengths that are most um, useful in photosynthesis. They are most used. And a little diagram taken out of uh, one of the textbooks shows that um, you've got these peaks um, at uh, the sort of blue-violet uh, end of the spectrum and also at the red end of the spectrum with a bit of a dip in the middle where you get the, the greens uh, and the yellows. Same sort of thing. Um, there are a couple of different plant pigments, a couple of different forms of chlorophyll. Um, there's also xanthophylls, uh, carotenes, yellow and sort of orangey kind of pigments as well that, that have a role to play um, in photosynthesis. And that's why we're not sort of seeing just two peaks and then complete drops. Uh, but what we do see is certainly significant drops in the um, amount of light that's absorbed uh, in the green part of the spectrum. Action spectra can also be uh, effective in looking at, um, uh, I guess, the effectiveness really of different wavelengths of light for any of the light dependent processes that occur in plants. Photosynthesis is just the most obvious one. Flowering is also something that um, can be light dependent. Uh, photoperiodism just refers to the um, changing length of the days. So um, at the moment we're doing this one as we lead into our winter and we know that the days are getting very, very short at the moment. It gets dark quite early. Uh, in the summer, the day length is much longer. So plants are sensitive to these differences in how much sunlight there is in a given day and therefore a lot of the timing of some of their processes, which can include things like flowering, uh, link into that. And another process which I haven't listed, but which you could also um, investigate, is the process of phototropism. Uh, phototropism is basically about the uh, pattern, studying the patterns of growth plants in response to light. And we know that um, the, the stem and the leaves will be growing, will be positively phototropic. They'll be growing towards the light. And the roots, on the other hand, are negatively phototropic. They grow away from the light. So that, generally speaking, there's also a geotropic um, response too, which is roots go down and stems go up um, in relation to gravity. Uh, even if you swivel them around, there's been some interesting experiments around there. But for this one, we're looking at light. Uh, so there's just some of those important processes that occur in plants that will relate to the amount of light that they have. So what I want to do is just very quickly um, go through these two very important stages of photosynthesis. We do have to look at the production of the products of photosynthesis. There's a huge amount of chemistry that's associated with um, these two processes and I think in order for us to study them we need to try and do it in a way that breaks some of that chemistry down a little bit so we don't have to remember a lot of really heavy duty chemistry here. The key I think in this is uh, what's actually happening in what we call photosystem 2. So there's a couple of photosystems that are part of um, this first or light dependent stage of photosynthesis Hopefully you can sort of look at something like this and see this sort of structure and say, okay, well, this looks like a membrane structure to me. We've looked at these um, 
bilipid layers, so two layers of lipids with the tails together and the heads away from each other. And then we've, we've talked about uh, channel proteins, for example, as things that get involved uh, in moving material from one side of the membrane to the other. In this case, we've got what's called the thylakoid membrane. So within the structure of the um, chloroplasts, we have these kind of little stacks of discs and then a, a sort of a space around them. The little discs themselves are thylakoids. When you stack them all together, you get a grana. Um, and then they are sitting inside of a, a, a part of the, of the chloroplast, which we call the stroma. So generally speaking, we can kind of simplify it a little bit down to saying that the first stage is what's happening here in the thylakoid membrane, so in the grana, and the second uh, stage will happen in the stroma. Um, the most important thing that you need to be aware of here is that the light's actually about um, exciting some electrons. So it, it allows those electrons to move, and the electrons are very important um, part of the process that's occurring here. But one of the key parts of this is um, that in the light-dependent stage, we are looking very much at the breakdown of water. So at this first stage, um, our reactant is water. Our product, our main product, is oxygen. And when we look at tracing this, we find that the oxygen that's produced as a result of this process of photosynthesis is pretty much all as a result of this first light-dependent stage, the breakdown of water into hydrogen ions and into oxygen molecules. Now, these hydrogen ions are being produced here in what looks like the thylakoid lumen or the space within or between the membranes of the thylakoid. And um, that's not where we want it. We want the hydrogen ions uh, out back up here into the stroma, into the uh, outside of the thylakoid membrane. So we've got to pump them back out. So we need a mechanism for being able to do that. And part of what, what happens is that these two photosystems, one and two, tend to work hand in hand to allow us to use that extra energy that's being delivered from light um, to pump these hydrogen ions back out into the stroma. Important um, that, uh, I guess, accompanying this process is also the production of uh, ATP and also a very important carrying compound called NADP, um, which has the hydrogens attached to it. Uh, this is a reducing agent, and, uh, and it's produced as a result of this first light-dependent stage of photosynthesis. So water is obviously very important at this stage. It's going to be broken down into oxygen and also hydrogen ions, which with these uh, flowing electrons are going to be made available um, in various forms uh, for the second part of photosynthesis. The light independent stage, so something that doesn't have to have light to um, go, uh, is this conversion or sometimes it's called the fixing stage, the carbon fixing stage, where we fix the hydrogen ions that we had previously to uh, carbon dioxide. Now this happens in a very complex process known as the Calvin cycle, and I, I really think this is probably way too much chemistry for us to worry about at this stage. Um, certainly something if you're interested in it to have a look at, um, but there's some very uh, complex uh, compounds that are part of uh, the Calvin cycle. And generally speaking, you need to have six rounds of this Cal uh, Calvin cycle in order to lock six of those um, carbon uh, atoms in to form these uh, glucose molecules. So it's a complex structure. Um, it's fueled by ATP. We know ATP is one of those very important um, biomolecules that's uh, the energy carrier, the energy uh, currency for the cells, and also, as I mentioned, by NADPH. This is a this is kind of a little representation of NADPH here. Um, it's um, nicotinamide, ad adenine, um, dinucleotide phosphate hydrogen. So that's pretty much what it is. Uh, forget it. It's very complex. Uh, the adenine is here. We've got a dinucleotide. We've got our uh, nicotinamide up here. 
And then we've got our phosphate group down the bottom, and that's where the hydrogen is going to attach. Um, that is very complex chemistry and certainly something which I wouldn't be expecting senior chemists to be aware of, much less senior biologists. But if you're interested, if you have a chemistry interest, you might want to look at that in a little bit more detail. What's the takeaway? The takeaway is that this process is what gives us our second product um, of photosynthesis, which is our glucose. So that's where the second product comes from. So how do they move? Well, the glucose primarily moves uh, via diffusion. So we know that's going to go from um, just a high to a low concentration, and often it'll move through the stoma. Uh, out of the plant. So oxygen is required for respiration, as we're aware, but um, there's an excess of oxygen and that excess of oxygen is going to um, disappear out through the stomata. Glucose is locked up in carbohydrate partitioning and what we do talk about in plants is this idea of source to sink. So for example, carbohydrates like glucose would be sourced in the leaf because that's the site of photosynthesis, they'd be moved to a sink like the roots. The roots are obviously going to be um, a place where photosynthesis is not going to occur, but um, glucose is definitely needed there. And so that's one of these places where we can identify uh, the tracking of glucose going from source to sink. How do we know this? Well, we go back to these radioactive traces that we talked about in the previous video. So have a look at um, some of that material to sort of help you understand how it is that we can actually track some of these important chemicals as they're moving from one part of the plant to another. This is a longer video than probably some of the ones that you're used to, um, and there's a lot of stuff in here, and we'll have to unpack some more of it uh, in class too. But hopefully it just gives you a quick overview of those two important stages of photosynthesis, how those two products are generated, and briefly what happens to them as they move around the plant. Thanks for watching.